Good morning, everyone. Um, we had given an extra minute or two just to let colleagues join us from their first call this morning. So um, bear with us whilst we allow that and we do that. Um, can I just welcome you all to our webinar this morning? Um, this is the first of our Matt Standards webinar series, and we're very excited to sort of get that over the line and, and share with you some fantastic speakers and contributions. Um, so we're hoping to kick off just about five past. Um, we do ask that participants turn off their videos um, and their microphones. It does help with the call quality. Um, and if for any reason you have any technical glitches or you're unable to hear anything or see things, if you don't mind emailing our email address, which we can put in the chat, um, and we'll pick that up. So we've got some staff who in the back office will just make sure that you're able to see and hear everything that you should. Um, before we get into the content of this morning, can I just do a bit of housekeeping um, just to kind of keep everybody right? Um, for those of you who I don't know, um, my name is Ruth Robin and I'm the portfolio lead within Healthcare Improvement Scotland around substance use and housing and homelessness. Um, I've been involved in drugs work um, for a number of years now um, and this is the programme of work that we support in terms of the uh, MIST team, who I'm sure you all know, um, the MAT Assisted Treatment um, Implementation Support Team. And they're with us today, which is great. And today is an opportunity for us to get create connections, um, have some reflections and consider what next steps might look like. So just in terms of introductions, then we do have an email address, which is his.matt at nhs.scot. If for any reason you've got any technical difficulties, we do ask that you mute your microphone and switch off your video. It does help with the bandwidth. This is a hybrid event um, in that we have a number of different digital functions happening. We have breakout rooms and we have pre-recorded messages um, and we have speakers, which is fantastic for us to be able to bring this to you virtually. Um, we are hoping to do a mixture of events over the course of the kind of coming years. So keep an eye out for those face-to-face -face opportunities because they are real now and they are great when we do them. We will be using our chat function today. So please use that to post comments, questions, reflections. Um, if we have time throughout the course of the session, we will put our questions that you pose to our speakers. Um, oftentimes we find that we run out of time because we get caught up in the excitement of the conversation and don't worry too much about that because any questions that pop up during the chat we'll sweep up and we'll put it in a submission out to everybody who attended today. Before we get into the context that we operate in, I think it's really important for us to remember that whilst we talk about the numbers of people who are affected by drug related deaths that we don't forget that those are individuals that are loved by families and exist within our communities. And it's really important that during the course of this webinar this morning, if we hear anything that you might feel is upsetting or triggering in any way, that you leave the chat and leave the call. Our chat is a public good space, so everything that you put in there is available to all. Um, and we do ask that we don't put anything um, private or confidential in that chat. If through the course of the call you have any specific concerns or questions in relation to anything we're chatting about today, please contact us at his.mat at nhs.scot and we'll do our best to pick that up over the course of the morning. Um, so let me give you a little bit of context before we go into our first pre-recorded message, um, if that's OK. So Healthcare Improvement Scotland, for those of you that don't know, has a, a role in many parts of the health system and specifically in relation to um, drug and alcohol services that sit within that recovery oriented system of care. Um, our role at the minute in relation to this work is to support the MIST team. So that's the uh, Medical Assisted Treatment Implementation Support Team, who I'm sure you're all very familiar with. And our role here is to support colleagues across the Scottish Government and Public Health Scotland in the implementation of MAT standards, but also how do we create the learning spaces for that system to be engaged with each other and to inspire each other? So this is really an opportunity for you guys to share with peers and colleagues your experiences, your successes, um, and really celebrate that. Um, it's really important for us as in Healthcare Improvement Scotland to create the safety of that space and to allow you the chance to share with each other um, what you're learning, delivery and deployment of MAT standards. So that's what hopefully this and the subsequent sessions will allow you to do. So across this morning, um, you're going to hear from a number of fantastic speakers um, who are really engaged in the work and, and deliver at a very high level to a really expert level as well. And it's an opportunity for you to hear from them and make those connections and links and reach out to individuals if you don't know them or, or hear a little bit more about what they're doing. And you'll see on the screen just now our agenda today. So um, 
I'm absolutely delighted that the new Minister for Drugs and Alcohol Policy at the Scottish Government, Elena Whittam, is able to give us a pre-recorded message. And we've checked the tech. Fingers crossed it works. Um, if for any reason that doesn't work, um, we'll address that as, as the time progresses this morning. We've also got a number of colleagues who you may or may or may not know. So we've got Julie Heslin McCartney, and she's a clinical effectiveness lead for the East Region within the Scottish Ambulance Service. We've also got Lesley Campbell. Um, she is the Drug and Alcohol Recovery Service Team Lead at Caithness and Sutherland from NHS Highland. Um, and then we're going to go into some breakout sessions and uh, that will be facilitated. We've got somebody within the organisation will facilitate that for you. We've got some key questions that we're keen to understand from you guys. Um, and then we'll bring you back to the main room. So please don't worry, you don't have to do anything. The system should, fingers crossed, no technical glitches um, facilitate you and take you there anyway. And then when you come back, we're going to hear from Lesley Campbell, um, eh, sorry, from John Campbell, unrelated, I hear, um, from the Injection Equipment Provision Manager at NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Um, and I'm sure um, you'll all probably be aware of some of that stuff that's been happening anyway. And then we're going to have Natalie Logan McLean, who's the Chief Exec at Cisco. So um, we've got some fantastic content to cover with you today. We're very excited to get this first webinar moving. Um, we're hoping that this is really beneficial to you. Um, after we've heard from all of our speakers and, and we've covered all of our content, we do have a wee evaluation um, and that will help us design the next future sessions. Um, and hopefully you get out of this session um, enough reassurance about celebrating the success that you've achieved. And let's not forget that the delivery of MAT standards requires that system to respond and to do that. So there's a massive recognition from us about the volume of work that's happened across the system to deliver MAT standards and to ensure that it's been implemented. And I know that the timeline of getting reports in and stuff like that was very recent. And so you're probably feeling a bit of relief about getting that milestone achieved. So thank you so much um, for your time this morning. Hopefully you find this as energising and engaging as we have. Um, and I'm going to pass you over to hear from our new Minister for Drug and Alcohol Policy at Scottish Government, um, Eleanor Whittam. So fingers crossed the tape works and we should be able to play that video now. Good morning, everyone. I would like to begin by thanking Healthcare Improvement Scotland for inviting me to launch this webinar today. And I'd also like to thank everyone for taking the time to attend and to those of you who are presenting for sharing your knowledge and your experience. Today is the first in what I hope will be a popular and informative series of webinars from Healthcare Improvement Scotland's new and dedicated MAT learning system. It's going to be a chance for people to come together to discuss the progress of the implementation of the MAT standards, to look at some of the different challenges that are being faced across the country and the innovative solutions that are being taken to overcome them and what the priorities are going to be going forward. The session today will hopefully provide an opportunity for those listening to engage in some discussion, prompt some questions, and really importantly, to make links and learn from each other. I know that areas have been working tirelessly to implement the MAT standards, but we have to sometimes stop and think, why are they important? And why do we need to continue our efforts to implement them at pace? And the answer to this is really simple. Drugs deaths in Scotland are far too high. Many of you in attendance to here today will know that last year we lost 1,330 fellow citizens to drug-related harm. And I would like to take this opportunity to express my deepest thoughts, my condolences to all of you who are affected by the loss of a loved one. And I'm only too aware from my own constituency and experience that the implementation of the MAT standards is making a difference. And I know that all areas across Scotland are working tirelessly towards full implementation. And that's not without its challenge. We face challenges such as workforce pressures and the particular nuances of providing care in remote and rural areas are only a couple of examples. There's still a great deal of work to be done to make sure that the standards are not only implemented, but they're fully sustained and embedded into everyday practice. I am, however, heartened to learn that areas are overcoming these barriers, challenging what was once seen as the norm and innovating to improve services and drive best practice. And for that, I would like to thank every one of you for the work that you do and will continue to do. Information, good practice, innovation and learning should always be celebrated and shared. And I want areas to talk to and learn from each other. No one area should ever feel as if they're siloed or struggle on their own. And that's why events such as today 
which bring people together to share experiences and learning is so valuable. I would also encourage everyone to regularly visit and continue to engage with the learning system website. That's really important to keep learning up to date. The site's suitable for both professionals and for members of the public and can be used to access information relevant to the MAT standards, to gain insights, to share learning, to sign up to and participate in engagement activities, indeed such as this one that you're having today. In closing, I again wish to recognise the amount of dedication and hard work that is going on right across Scotland to fully implement the MAT standards. The work being undertaken is delivering real change for those who use the services, their families, their loved ones and their communities. And I look forward to seeing how the Learning System website develops in the coming months and hope to join you all again for the next webinar, maybe even in person. So once again, from me and on behalf of the whole Scottish Government, thank you so very much. Fantastic. Um, and I hope all you were all able to hear that. Um, it's such a great opportunity for us to hear directly from the Minister for Drugs and Alcohol Policy at Scottish Government so early in our tenure. So a massive thanks from us to the Minister um, and able to create that opportunity for us and, and hear from her directly what it means to her for us to, to build this learning around you. Um, so can I just ask um, for our first speaker to put their camera on um, and we will be able to hear from you, Julie. So um, Julie Hazlin mccartney is the Clinical Effectiveness, Effectiveness Lead um, for the Scottish Ambulance Service and is joining us today to share with us some of the work they're doing around the National Non-Fatal Overdose Pathway. So Julie, if you want to open up your camera and your microphone, I'll pass over to you. Thank you so much. Um, hope everyone can see and hear me okay. Um, good morning and welcome and thank you very much for, um, for having me along to present to you today. Um, if I could just go to the probably the second slide, actually, just to start. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. So. Um, a bit of background. Um, in January 2021, um, the Scottish Ambulance Service embarked on an ambitious project um, in collaboration with the Scottish Drug Death Task Force, focusing on what we could do to maximise our contribution to the emergency response section of the task force strategy. And more recently, of course, the emergency response section of Scottish Government's national mission. So the opiates, namely heroin and methadone, remaining the prominent feature in post-mortem toxicology in the vast majority of drug related deaths. It was pertinent for us to design a solution um, to help us identify patients at risk of harm due to their use of substances and in particular, uh, obviously benzos and opiates, and link them into post-incident follow-up support with specialist services. So we would contribute to a national programme that allows every person in Scotland at risk of experiencing or witnessing um, a non-fatal overdose to have access to naloxone in an emergency situation, but that we would also acquire and embed the necessary governance to allow us to share information about those patients that we treat for a non-fatal overdose, whereby opiates or benzodiazepines have factored in their presentation to emergency care. Essentially, we want to ensure that they receive the follow-up support and turn our emergency response into a continuous care pathway for those at high risk um, of drug-related harm and death. Next slide, please. So the need for a data sharing pathway, I guess, was further cemented by the creation of the Medication Assisted Treatment Standards, and of course, in particular, MAT Standard 3, which seeks to proactively identify all those at high risk of drug-related harm. So the Scottish Ambulance Service would be able to directly contribute to the achievement of this standard uh, nationally um, via our non-fatal overdose pathway. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the non-fatal overdose pathway would, of course, require the sharing of patient identifiable data, which, as we know, is um, you know, subject to strict information governance and can be a bit of a tricky obstacle to overcome. But we did need to think about achieving a balance. We need to satisfy our data protection responsibilities and the need to share information for the purposes of saving lives. So a data protection impact assessment was drafted with careful consideration of UK GDPR guidelines and the NHS Scotland Act. And this agreement was established with all 14 territorial health boards in Scotland to provide a consistent and no postcode lottery approach to data sharing. Next slide, please. 
So how does the pathway work? Well, we have a set of flag criteria, which is written in the patient recording form. And if any of these flag criteria are met during a period of emergency care, it triggers the patient's details to be shared with their local health board. Reports are emailed daily to all 14 health boards in Scotland, and it's a rolling seven day report. So the flag criteria are any time our ambulance crew administer naloxone to a patient, any time naloxone or Narcan um, is written within the patient's notes, any time our ambulance crew push the corresponding buttons for opiates or street benzodiazepines, which is in a very specific screen within our electronic recording form called Substances Affecting Patients' Condition. And also on that screen, there is a free text section for additional comments. And if the crew choose to write the words heroin or methadone in there, that would be another flag. So if any one or more of these things happen, that patient's details are automatically emailed to their local health board um, and the local health board becomes the controller of that data. Um, they then have the obligation to um, send this information on to uh, local drug treatment services, assertive outreach teams, whoever it is that will be actioning that data um, at a local level to provide post-incident follow-up support for those individuals that we have identified. Next slide, please. So of course, the, the pathway does need to be considerate of patients who might not want their um, data to be shared with other services. So patient consent um, to share the data is obtained on scene where we can. Um, of course, medical emergencies, it can be quite difficult to have these conversations with patients for a number of different reasons. But if they're unable to give their consent, um, due to um, their medical uh, presentation or their, um, their capacity, um, or they just quite simply refuse to, to share their information, is registered as an objection with the ambulance service. All these objections are then considered by the drug harm reduction team and can be overruled where we can see that there's evidence of a clear risk to that person's life going forward. We've established a clear algorithm or set of questions that we run each incident through and these look at uh, whether or not the patient had a decreased level of consciousness when the crew conducted their initial assessment with that patient, if they had a respiratory rate of less than 10 breaths per minute, if the patient um, experienced a seizure, if there was evidence of previous episodes of overdose for that patient or we could see there was a clear escalating risk to loss of life. And also we need to think about um, if the episode of care with that patient concluded with no conveyance to hospital and that we could see that there were significant safety netting concerns. If any, any one of those things, if we answer yes to any of those, then the, we will overrule that objection and continue to send that patient's information to their local health board. The local health board then has the decision to make as to whether or not they will um, continue to try and contact that patient um, going forward. Next slide, please. So this data table does show us um, how things are going, what, what kind of um, number of incidents is the non-fatal overdose pathway sharing with health boards. So we can see that we have shared information thus far on 10,904 incidents, and that was within the time period of the 1st of July 2021 until the 31st of July this year. And you can see on your screen there that that's broken down by health board area. So it gives us an indication of uh, where the kind of number of referrals are and in which health boards area we're seeing most contact with patients. Um, using feedback from some of the health boards that are actioning this data, we know that approximately 40% of these patients were not active on the caseload of a community drug service and were not being offered or involved in support at the time that we shared their data. Some feedback from patients has been really positive um, and some case studies have showed us that some patients have experienced several non-fatal overdoses previously to the um, implementation of the pathway and really welcome the follow-up that this model offers them. So really overall, we feel that this does highlight the importance of ambulance service data to identify people who are not engaging in support, um, as evidence obviously does show us that engaging in support is a protective factor against drug-related death. And next slide, please. Thank you. This is the final slide. So really what we're thinking here is moving forward um, to the future. We need to think about measuring the outcomes from the pathway. And we really seek to further understand how our ambition to connect patient is to connect patients is really working in real terms for them. How are things really going? 
And we also need to think about the defini definition that we're currently using to capture patients, as this does need to evolve with the changing landscape of drug harm within our communities. So we need to look at the definition of the uh, sorry the, the the definition of the the data that we're capturing at the moment. Can it be broader? Is it working as intended? Are we capturing all the people that this definition needs to capture? Do we need to look at a wider at risk population of people? And we're, we've currently just redesigned our electronic patient recording form to do some of those things so that we can capture um, um, or cast the net wider, so to speak, and capture as many people as possible. And as I, I commented on there previously, we do, do we do need to look at the ever evolving um, changing landscape um, of drug use. And we know obviously an example of that at the moment is a significant rise in the prevalence of the injecting of cocaine and our current data definition does not capture that. So we do need to think um, perhaps more outside the box going forward about how we can change um, and evolve with the times. Um, and what we want to do is work in partnership to achieve um, those ambitions and we need to work together to seek uh, to understand the outcomes from the patients that we are identifying, what is actually happening to them at the end of this pathway and is it working as intended? And we obviously want to work together with um, Matt Standards and the MIST team and Scottish Government to achieve that so that we can have a true measurement of the impact um, on the prevention of harm and reduction in deaths. And that's all from me. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, and I'm really interested in that evolving demographic that we're seeing. Um, and we see that across not only MAT standards work, but also in relation to other recovery and treatment services and residential rehab. And um, are we equipped and set up to deal with that new demographic at as rapid changing rates? Um, so I'm really thoughtful about that. And, and I certainly have questions um, for you in relation to that. Um, thank you so much. Um, can I ask now, Leslie? I do have questions, Julie, but we'll catch you both together if we've got time. Um, Leslie, can I ask you just to open up your your camera and your microphone and are you okay just to take over from here? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, thank you. So if you jump to the next slide, that'll be great. So I'm um, Leslie, as you can see, um, and I have a really fancy title of the Drug and Alcohol Recovery Service Team Lead for Caithness and Sutherland, which is basically a senior charge nurse role. Um, the team you see in the picture is the Caithness team, apart from Sarah, who was off the day in March that Shauna from MIST visited us. And before I go on, I just want to acknowledge that although I'm presenting this project, it is very much an achievement of the whole team. The other pictures um, were also taken in March this year. Both of them will give you a little bit more of a knowledge about me. One of them will hopefully encourage you to travel north and visit us or come and have a job. Um, so if you move on to the next slide, thank you. So this is Caithness and for those that don't know, I'll take you on a wee short geography lesson. So as you can see, Caithness is situated in the furthest northeast point of the mainland UK, although some of the postal services don't seem to think so. Caithness has a population of just over 25,000 people in a 712 square mile area. The two main towns of Wick and Thurso are 20 miles apart and um, there are various smaller villages and hamlets. We host the most northerly point of mainland UK at Dunnet Head. And John O'Groats is the furthest distance from Land's End at 874 miles. So being remote has its challenges for service delivery, as you can imagine. Demographically, we have an ageing population with a continuingly high mortality and ill health. We have more deaths than births in the region. And the majority of deaths are in the over 60s but we do have a high kind of spike rate around about the male age 30 to 44 year old category. We have 9.6% of our working age population in employment deprivation and four zones in Caithness fall within the 20% most deprived areas in Scotland, indicating severe and multiple disadvantage is a very real risk for our patient population. In Caithness, Stars um, were made up of two band six nurse prescribers, one based in each side of the county, a part time band five nurse and two permanent support workers. We take an average of 173 referrals a year and hold a team caseload of between 90 and 100 people at any given time, 40% of which is prescribed opiate substitute treatment. 
We have no third sector supports or counselling services, though we do have an active AANA fellowship. And it was for all of those reasons that our team secured an additional two support workers to deliver this project. I'll get you to move on to the next slide. OK, so let's look at how it started. So as um, Julie said, Matt Standard 3, um, for anyone on the planet who hasn't heard, demands services to proactively identify those at high risk of drug harm and assertively outreach them, offering a range of supports and ultimately engaging them in treatment. That is a big ask. And when we were first actioned with that as a team, we froze. As many other teams have, um, we don't have the time, the resources, and we don't have the right to go knocking on people's doors. So how can we do it? So we used lean methodology and the model for improvement. We took time together as a team to look at where we were and where we wanted or needed to be. And we always knew that we wanted to in-reach or outreach custody because of the well-documented escalation and risk. We also wanted the permission to do more, to support people to come into treatment. So we looked at our priorities, we simplified our processes to build that capacity within the team, and we looked at the gaps and the target market. So what are we trying to accomplish? Easy, we're trying to reduce drug deaths. How will we know that that change is an improvement? We'll have less deaths and less frequent NFOD reports from SAS. But what change can we make that will result in improvement? So we'll move on to the next slide. So um, previously, any professional or the person themselves could refer and we would receive that referral and then contact them, them on same day and offer an initial assessment over the phone. Our partners in SAS, as Julie said, will provide non-fatal overdose reports, as we heard earlier. But if that person wasn't known to us or not open to the team, no further action was taken on them. Now we outreach every NFOD report that we get. We take referrals as normal but we'll also take concerned loved ones information and again outreach that person. We've also always done in reaching into the hospital, so that's it, job done. No, not good enough. That will not increase your activity and I can assure you that the same old, same old isn't going to work. So now what? Well, here's the crux of Matt Standard 3 for me in one word, proactive. That's it, just one word. And when we add that to everything else that we do, it changes how we view it. What does it mean to be proactive? Well, it's the opposite of reactive. And that's hard when we've been all working in reactive systems for such a long time. So we looked again at our reactive processes. We receive a referral and react. There's nothing proactive in that to identify people. We need other people to tell us when they are concerned for someone. We need our partners, and I'll talk about partnership working shortly. OK, so now we have a process whereby our partners identify people by way of an identification trigger mechanism, and we have the capacity to manage that on same day. So now we're able to open the doors and I'll move us on to the next slide just now. So then what we did was we wanted to keep the data to keep learning. So we use a digital value management board to watch our data grow over time. The value management board details what we aim to achieve and how and provides a visual display of progress in real time. We populate a box score using the data we want to collect within the five realms of quality, safety, experience, cost and capacity. And then we meet regularly to look at what we are seeing and test changes using PDSA cycles. Value management isn't new and Healthcare Improvement Scotland have got resources and case studies on their website and they didn't ask me to say that. The visual boards can be physically in your office or due to us having a spread out team can be digital and held on MS Teams. So let's return to the, so if you go forward on the slides, we'll return to what we were saying about partners. No, sorry, the other way, the, the correct way, yeah. So we'll go back to partners. So. Partners, um, one of our major strengths of living in a small community is the connections that we have with our partner agencies. For 15 years now, I've worked within the community closely with my wider colleagues on various projects, big and small. 
Together, we use these opportunities to learn from each other and grow as one big team. It would be like an Oscars and BAFTA speech if I started naming them all. But when I had the opportunity to shadow my colleagues in police custody healthcare, I knew I was at the last piece of that jigsaw. I watched and learned and a light bulb went off. Three services working in sync with simple processes linking them. As a drug and alcohol service, we know what high risk of drug harm means. And if I opened this out to every single one of you, you would likely give me a different answer. But did you know that there is no specific descriptor or list of key criteria or a rating scale? So what makes you high risk rather than medium or low risk? And we're told low threshold. Um, but again, what does that mean to our partners? It means that our job is not only to proactively support people into the service, but it's also our job to proactively support our partners to identify people we deem to be high risk of drug harm. We needed a jigsaw piece that serves to educate our partners, and that's what our partners do in custody. The VA checklist, so we learned from them and adapted it. We use it to share the need to know information to proactively identify people and trigger an assertive outreach response. With all good partnership working, we communicate regularly about individuals that we're concerned for, but we also meet to discuss this project, gaining views and opinions along the way. And as we went along this process, it was obvious that the people that know more about our community and those at risk are our community. As a service taking open referral, and self-referral, the only people we couldn't take a referral from were concerned loved ones, yet they often know more than anyone the risks being taken. Concerned loved ones are our community partners. And if they call us worried for someone, we complete the trigger checklist on their behalf and outreach the person. That's what it means to be proactive, finding people before they end up on an NFOD list or worse. So before I move on, I just want to share with you a part of a local song by Donald Sutherland. Now come all ye people, come over the ord, there's a welcome awaiting that you can afford. Be ye a pauper or be ye a lord, you will always be welcome in Caithness. That song from my childhood holds no truer a word today as it did then. You see, Caithness folk will treat you no different, no matter the money you have. They will welcome you, host you and haste you back. But if you dare make a mistake, you can look out. It will be held against you. And this is the life lived by many of the people we serve. Being high risk of drug harm comes with a lack of connection, contempt, discord and stigma. These are the barriers faced in a rural community. And by proactively working with our whole community, we afford the opportunity to raise awareness, reduce stigma and social outcasting. We'll move on to the next slide. Do hope by now you've picked up my message about being proactive in life, but if not, it may be worth just pondering what proactive partnerships, proactive prevention, proactive processes, proactive planning and proactive person-centeredness means to you and your services. Okay, next slide. So we're almost at happily ever after. I'd like to share our biggest and most consistent challenge as again, Julie's also mentioned, confidentiality and information sharing. So we had to seek advice and approval from NHS Highlands Caldecott Guardian because despite our tight partnerships and the potential mortality, the internal processes wouldn't allow sharing of information without consent. It's not OK to just accept that anymore. People are dying. It wouldn't be OK to not phone an ambulance or the police so get comfortable with quoting these principles, particularly number seven. And the next slide. So here's a snapshot of our data so far. As you can see, over the course of three months, we've received 20 trigger checklist referrals, which gives a median of one a week. The bulk of these referrals actually came within team and the police, which isn't really that surprising. But more interestingly, 10% or almost 10% came from concerned loved ones. One of those actually prevented someone from returning to injecting heroin and supported an increase in methadone. Okay, so next slide, last slide. 
So that's it. So what next? Well, on the 1st of May, we move into phase two. We're proactively supporting our emergency department and medical ward of the local general hospital to identify those at high risk and spread some of our work both south to Inverness, where our main custody team will begin testing the process along with them. We'll be bringing along the prison and our local housing department into our story. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Leslie. Um, and I'm aware that's the first time you've done this, so you did remarkably well. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, I'm really interested in what you're saying around um, the measures that you've got in place for this work. And I'm particularly thoughtful about balancing measures in terms of if you invest in preventative intervention, whilst you may see a drop in um, one area of business, you might see increasing demand in another. And how do we take that into consideration in our planning? Because I think that in order for us to reach out people to people proactively, as, you, as you've suggested, you need to allow that resource to be there. And, and so how do you continue to offer a crisis intervention, but also do the proactive component part of that? Um, and I'm really thoughtful about that in this work. Um, and I think it's great to hear how well you guys have adopted a QI. As a QI organisation, I'm, I'm a bit of an anorak with that, so I was getting very excited seeing all your charts and all that. Um, we are just about to go into a breakout session, so we don't have time for questions for both yourself and Julie. So what we'll do is we'll pick up the questions that come in the chat and we'll send them to you afterwards and maybe you can respond and we'll put it in our post-event um, information for folks. So um, thank you so much. Um, the computer should naturally just take you to your breakout sessions um, and then I'll see you back here just about noon um, by the time you've been into your breakout rooms. So um, it shouldn't necessarily, you shouldn't need to do anything, it should just automatically take you there. Thank you very much to all the speakers so far. Good afternoon, everybody. Hopefully you are all starting to stream back out of your breakout rooms. Um, I couldn't help but have a sneaky peek at the Miro board um, and it looks like a very energising conversation. Um, so we're just going to give a minute or two to let the other breakout rooms just rejoin us. So bear with us a wee minute whilst we just make sure we've got everybody back. So I think that's everyone back who we were expecting. Um, so thank you everybody um, for participation in your breakout rooms. It's always really exciting for me to go in and see the mural board start to get populated and for content to be added to it, which is great. Um, so we are moving into the second of our two of our four, uh, second two of our group of speakers. Um, so if I can ask John Campbell to put his video on and, and unmute his microphone, that would be great. Um, so I'm just going to pass over to you, John, if you can hear and see me OK. I think you're muted. Let's double check. I'm going to try that again. No, we can't hear you. Is it just, can, I, can anyone else hear? John, if you can give me a thumbs up, if you can hear him. Hey, John, I think you're, I don't know if it's your headphones. Not sure. Let's see if we can sort that out um, in the background. Um, can I then ask Natalie if you want to come on just now? Is that okay? Um, Whilst else we get see if we can do okay. sort. Thank you so much. You so um, much. I'm getting some I'm feedback. Getting some it might be my end. end. Um, so if you want to mute yours, Natalie, yeah. until I just line you up, that would be great. Thank you so much. Um, so, Natalie, over to you in terms of your presentation and we'll just get the presentation moved on and then we can come back to John once we see what the technical glitch is, um, if that's OK. So, um, Natalie, you're the Chief Exec at Cisco, so um, I'll pass over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much, uh, Lindsay, for having me on this today. I have had about 400 phone calls and meetings from 7 o'clock this morning, so I'm just trying to get my head into a bit of leverage. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome from me and the team at Cisco. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, so who are Cisco? We are predominantly a prison-based service, 
although due to the pandemic, we had to respond to some community crises. So we looked to how we could replicate what we do in the prison and do that by creating a bridge from prison to the community. Next slide, please. So before we go into what the bridge between prison and the community is for Cisco, let's just have a think about from our perspective, which is lived experience, ground level, the most fundamental element for us at the MAT standards is implementing a trauma-informed approach and ensuring that we meet the needs of the clients that we seek to support. That's probably the most important element to get everything else within the MAT standards right. We need to make sure that we offer people safety, build trust in relationships, and they equally need to know that we have their right need in our hearts. We offer many, many elements of the standards, but coming from a criminal justice perspective and working from the prison, as you can imagine, it's very difficult for us to imp implement all of them. For example, in the prison, it's difficult to get same day access to treatment because you're working with 14, 1500 prisoners within an establishment, and it's almost impossible for them to do that. But I know that that's something the MAT standards are working with on a deeper level from what we're involved in. So how do we implement the MAT standards from prison to the community? Well, we ensure that all our participants that attend either prison or community services have the opportunity to be informed about their choice, their choice of treatment, their choice of opiate replacement therapy, and also their choice of what the recovery looks like. There's been so many arguments over harm reduction versus sobriety versus recovery. And the bottom line is there has to be many pathways of recovery in order for people to succeed. And not everybody wants complete abstinence. So we look at what is people's choices. We then identify what method of support they want. So is it the 12 steps? Is it looking at smart recovery and having a more cognitive based approach? Or is it simply just looking at an opiate replacement therapy and maintaining the recovery throughout that? We then know that our statistics in the prison, 47% of the prison population score below the age of 10 when it comes to numeracy and literacy. So we really try to engage them in further education and try and help them just to build a CV prior to being released. We also know that people don't really look after their well-being if they're using drugs and alcohol. And the last thing they want to think about is having a balanced meal. So we look at how important their physical health is, as well as their mental well-being, and how when we look after our physical health, it supports our well-being. And that's everything that's in the MAT standards. That's everything that we're trying to do, is bring all these approaches together to make it better for the, those we seek to support. Trauma workshops and coaching. Now, the advocacy element and the trauma element is something that we really, really push at Cisco. We are absolute advocates for what is right for someone. And that's simply because we listen to them. We don't decide what we think someone's care should be. We listen to them and then we advocate for what they believe their care should be. And we do that in a very, very trauma aware and trauma sensitive manner. Within our environment, we do not have posters on the wall saying if you shout, yell or raise your voice, you'll be asked to leave because that's not trauma informed. We need to know that the people we work with are going to be frustrated. They've been let down and they've been failed by services time and time again. And again, just at the end of that bridge, it's the important thing is the signposting so that people can equally build positive relationships with the many partners that we work with um, before they leave prison. Next slide, please. So how do we support the many pathways of recovery? Number one, we do an intervention with the person that we're supporting. Number two, we look at what psychosocial supports they need. People that are caught in the cycle of offending, people that are caught in the cycle of addiction, predominantly are consumed with shame and guilt. So they don't seek to ask for help or they don't know that help is available. So we look at what psychosocial supports we can put in place. We then determine what life skills they have. Can they manage a tenancy? Have they ever been able to budget? Can they cook for themselves? 
What is the family dynamics like? We then look at the ORT. So what is the treatment provision? Do they need treatment provision? Are they known by services? We just heard when we were looking at uh, the ambulance statistics, so many people are not known by services. And we find that with the clients that we have in the community. They don't know what um, treatment um, provision, they don't know about rehab, and they really don't know about choice. Then the final bit for us would just be to look at what recovery supports are suitable for them. Do we refer them into the You Decide project? project? Do they need a navigator or do they simply just need someone to mentor them throughout their journey? Next slide, please. So how do we get to addiction to a place of recovery? As you can see, it's quite a journey. It takes probably for everyone that's on this um, webinar to work better together. Over the past seven years, what I've recognised is so many organisations work in conflict and isolation, and that's just not a conducive approach for the MAT standards to work, and not only for them to work, but for them to work well. Organisations need to get better at joined up working. That means that we need to get better at information sharing. That means that social work are not better than community addiction teams, that community addiction teams are not better than community working teams or grassroots organisation. It means that we're all equally out to set the same goal. We're all on the same page and that we want people in Scotland to get well. We want them to get better. We want to reduce drug deaths and we want to reduce recidivism. I want my children to live in a safer Scotland. And in order to do that, we need to go through the brief intervention, the psychosocial supports, introducing people to recovery pathways. Harm reduction supports is so, so important. We've worked with so many people that are injecting drug users, but no one's shown them how to properly inject drugs. So they're creating so much harm in their body. The trauma-informed approach that is so vital to getting the MAT standards right. Partnership working. If we didn't have 32 existing partners at Cisco, we would fail. We can't do it all, and we don't think that we can do it all, but what we can't do, our partners fill the gap, and they do it extremely well. Relapse prevention. It's about enforcing to individuals that relapse doesn't mean failure. It just means it's part of your journey and it's something that they can be supported with. And again, that's the element of choice that comes into the MAT standards. It's about people, not everyone wants abstinence. Some people want to just maintain on their ORT medication. Life skill opportunities. And again, educational opportunities. So for people in recovery, or caught in the cycle of addiction. This is something they've never been offered. I'm someone that's in long-term recovery. I am 10 years sober, and I know that I certainly didn't go to school and ask my teacher to become drug dependent or alcohol dependent and feel my family and my own children. That was not how I set out to live my life, but coming from poverty, disadvantage, and having no opportunities meant that my life was going to go on a very negative pathway, but I was very fortunate to be able to go through this whole cycle and get to a place of recovery. The element of the MAT standards for us, and I think we heard a bit about it earlier on, was the implementation of the prison to residential pathway. For us, that's been one of the most successful things that we've saw within certainly HMP Berlin. This morning, I actually just contacted the prison just to look at some of the st statistics that we've had from that and the success of the money that the Scottish Government had given down. So we have had five men successfully complete rehab. That was 12 weeks funded by the Scottish Government. We currently have three men in treatment and we have six that have been suitably assessed to leave prison and go straight into rehab upon release. Next slide, please. This is just some of the partners that, that we work with. And I think that, again, it's important that we share as much information as we can with our partners. So we do have a consent to share information on 
all of our paperwork, our client service users and the men that we work with in the prison know that, they're happy for us to do that. And again, it means that we can just create a better joined up approach and they were not failing anyone. And one of the elements of the MAT standards is about retention. If we can retain someone in prison and support them throughout their recovery journey, it makes it easier for the services in the community to pick them up because again, we can look at retaining them. We can look at that mentor support. We can look at referring them to navigators um, and all the additional services that we have in place. Next slide, please. This is not really relevant to the MAC standards, but when it comes to getting the MAC standards right and looking at cost comparisons, comparisons and cost benefit analysis, if we get the MAC standards right, we can reduce a, loss, a lot of these costs for the taxpayers because it means that men and women are not returning to prison. It means that we get the treatment right. It means that we have a set of outreaches in place with great mentor support. It means that we're working with harm reduction services. It means that we're implementing psychosocial supports and giving people choice. And it means that even if men don't get that access to same day treatment in prison, it means the community will get it right and they will certainly get it in the community. We work with independent advocacy agencies because again, we are not informed in all the legalities, but what we don't know, our partners at Reach Advocacy or Shelter Scotland would certainly be able to fill in that information. So thank you for listening to me and I hope I didn't waffle on too long. Um, I just tried to make it as bright and fluffy for a Friday afternoon as I possibly could, but the match standards read and write beautifully, and I just hope that we can all implement them as well as they're written, because it means that we reduce, we really do reduce, reduce the drug deaths, and we reduce men and women going back to prison, and I think that we all just want a safer Scotland for all of us, actually, so thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Natalie. Um, I'm really interested in what you're saying around that bridge to recovery. Um, and everybody's bridge being different. And if you fall off, that's, that's absolutely fine. It's getting the reintegration into your plan and your long-term ambitions and goals continue to kind of um, develop as you go. And I'm really thoughtful about that. Um, I am hoping that John can join us now. John, do you want to come on screen and let us know? I'm still not hearing any sound. Is anybody else hearing sound? Bless John. Nothing worse when the technology fails you. Um, there's nothing at my end. I'm not sure if anyone else can somebody raise their hand if they can hear John. Do you want to leave John and rejoin us and see if that helps? We'll give you a minute. Great, thank you very much, John. We'll do that. Um, see whilst I've got you on the screen, Natalie. Can I just pick up one of the questions that's in the chat? So you talked a lot about um Recovery organisations, not recovery organisations, partner, partnership organisations or organisations that work alongside you. What do you think the role of advocacy plays in your work? The, for us, the role of advocacy is absolutely fundamental. What we find is for a lot of the men and women leave in prison, we work under something called the Shore Standards. That's suitable housing on release for everyone. And we know there's not great housing stock um, in Scotland across the board. But a lot of men leave prison in recovery, doing really, really well, maintaining their recovery, and the prison will release them into a hostel. We know that hostels are chaotic. They, they are full of people using drugs and selling drugs. So we're really setting people up to fail. So it's about getting all these pathways right. So what we find is that when we get advocacy services in to, to act as that, middle voice, they have the legislations in place, you know, they can kind of enforce that better than us, you know, we use the, them as the middle guy. So using like, for example, the Glasgow Advocacy Project, we're recently able to advocate for us and ensure that an individual didn't go to a hostel and in fact went to a temporary accommodation. Now by doing that, he's been able to maintain his recovery. He's committed to coming to Cisco three days a week. He's also engaged with Waverly Care, so we know that he's looking at the harm reduction stuff. 
you know, so he's linked in with multiple organizations, but again, had the advocacy project not been able to advocate for him to get him into that, um, his own tenancy, he would probably have already offended and be back, been back in prison. Um, I really, I, I would absolutely echo what you're saying about advocacy. Um, I worked for Shelter Scotland for a time and a significant amount of the work that we would do for people who were coming out of prison and um, or in recovery or perhaps they experienced relapse was about making sure that they were kind of supported to get the right housing solution. And I think um, oftentimes um, the use of B&Bs and, and things like that just add so much complexity to an already difficult situation that it just seems totally unfair. So um, I think the introduction of the unsuitable accommodation order extension is really helpful. Uh, Housing First has also offered something, but I do think the continuation of advocacy, and, and it's great that Matt Standard 8 particularly calls that out, because I think it's such a key component part of trying to get people on their journey and, and keep them well and safe. So I would absolutely agree with you. Now, John, are we going to go for third time's a charm? I'm back to the headphones, so yes. hope you can hear me. Oh, thank you. Yes, we can indeed. So, John, okay. over to you. Okay, well, thank you. Really sorry, people, about the, the, the slight technical problem there. So, my name's John Campbell. I'm the Injecting Equipment Provision Manager for all uh, IEPs across Greater Glasgow uh, and Clyde. Uh, in this short presentation, I want to talk a little bit about the WAND Harm Reduction uh, Initiative in Glasgow. Uh, okay, next slide. So first of all, I want to give you a background on some of the drug cams we've seen in Glasgow over the past uh, 30 years or so. And go back to the mid-1980s, that was also a time where uh, we experienced an outbreak of HIV. But in Glasgow, there was a lot of other things happening at that time. In particular, as well as people injecting heroin, people were injecting uh, a benzodiazepine called temazepam. Uh, the way people were using that in Glasgow was different for many other cities uh, across the world they were actually squeezing the gel out of the capsule heating up their spoon a little bit of water and injecting it it was causing horrendous injecting related complications so for us in glasgow the problems that people are experiencing with benzodiazepine use are really are nothing new in the 1990s were a time for us it was characterized with a very high prevalence of hepatitis c in the early 90s it was a time we noticed drug related deaths uh, were increasing and those drug related death increases were in part due to the use of heroin and benzodiazepines together. 2000 with 23 deaths through uh, a spore forming bacteria outbreak, Clostridium uh, novii, and then towards the end of that decade, uh, again, spore forming bacteria containing contaminated heroin uh, claimed 14 lives in Scotland, but nine of those deaths happened in Greater Glasgow and Clyde. 2011 was a time we've seen the newer benzodiazepines emerging, uh, and that was obviously driving a lot of harm. And it wasn't so much the chemical structure of the new benzodiazepines, but the fact that they were being punched out in pill presses, you know, across our area, uh, changed the way they were sold. They were then sold, you know, in bags of 50 or 100 or 500. So people started consuming far more at that time, one of the key drivers for a range of harms we experienced. Back to sport former bacterial outbreaks in 2015, Glasgow City Centre, over 30 people hospitalised in a very short space of time. The same driver was contaminated heroin. The same year we identified outbreak of HIV, which has now reached 190. 2019, across Scotland, you'll know it was the highest recorded drug-related deaths. And if you look at the board proportion of that, Greater Glasgow and Clyde affected more than any other board. In 2020, until the present day, we're noticing increases in a wide range of injecting-related harms and, and uh, complications. Next slide. So the WAND initiative uh, is essentially a multi-agency coordinated harm reduction drive. It's our biggest coordinated harm reduction drive that we've ever seen in the, the board area. It focuses on four key interventions, and each intervention is designed to tackle one of the key drug-related harms we're seeing. Uh, that's drug-related death, the prevalence of blood-borne viruses, and a wide range of injecting-related complications. So the four interventions are wound care, and by wound care, all we want to do is sit down with a client and visually inspect their injecting sites and get that recorded if it's good health or poor health. If it's poor health, we want to then get that treated in some way. Everything revolves around A, which is assessment of injecting risk. I'll talk to you a wee bit more in depth about that in just a wee second. 
uh, if the locks on, we don't just want to keep firing the locks on kits out there. We want to make sure when the clients come in, they participate in this, they're carrying the locks on. If they're not, we give them a new kit and ask them to take to carry it on them at all times. So almost training, if you like, in that respect. And they would be for dry blood spot uh, testing. Now, because we are still an area that's considered high risk, we encourage people to present for a dry blood spot test and therefore the WAND initiative uh, every three months. So what we have is, is a group of individuals that are coming back every three months to go through this, this intervention so we can see very, very clearly any increase or any decrease in uh, drug-related harm. It's an incentivised uh, initiative uh, and the incentive that we provide is rapid access to £20 cash through a multi-purpose uh, multi voucher. Next slide, please. Okay, so how the WAND initiative works, people present at uh, uh, one of our uh, participating WAND sites. We make sure they're eligible. Essentially, we want to make sure that they are actually currently injecting street drugs. If they are, we move on to the assessment of injecting uh, risk. Part of that injecting assessment injecting risk, we'll visually inspect the injecting sites and we'll record the health, as I mentioned earlier. earlier. That's what we'll also give out uh, in the lock zone or ensure the person is currently carrying a lock zone kit. Well, uh, ensure they provide us with a dry blood spot sample. And once all the interventions are complete, we'll then issue the pay point voucher. Pay point voucher is a barcode. The person will then go to one of the, the shops in the vicinity. They can go in, they can exchange that for cash. They can top up their gas, their electric, their mobile phone. They can buy some, uh, some shopping. Uh, but that incentive being so desirable has really drove footfall. OK, next slide, sorry. So I mentioned the, the key component to this is the assessment inject and risk. And I have been honest about it. We have never been good at sitting down with people that inject drugs and really go into depth about how they prepare and, and inject, their, inject their drugs. Well, the air tool is designed to change that. So this is a tool that was developed nationally. Uh, it was road tested in many areas across, across Scotland. And you'll see it's a tool that guides a member of staff as much as individual through the injecting process. A lot is colour coded, so visually it tells you if risk is occurring and the information at the top will advise a member of staff on what to do if risk is being uh, identified. It's a tool that sits on our NEO360 platform, so it's a, a platform that all IEPs in Scotland have access to. But I really need to stress that the data for this is incredible. But it's not a survey and it's not a, a research tool. This is a comprehensive assessment. And at the end of that assessment, a plan should be made in place for the client so to allow them to uh, go away, change an ejected practice and hopefully reduce the harm that we've identified. OK, next slide. Uh, wand for us in Greater Glasgow and Clyde only happened because there was an air tool available. You know, all areas contributed, tweaked, you road tested that, that air tool, and when it was fit for purpose, we could then start to start to use it. We had buy-in from our third sector partners, particularly the senior management, who were aware that by signing up to provide this initiative meant there was going to be significantly more work for them in that respect. And that was very same for the frontline staff as well, you know, participated in that. And it was actually really challenging for many of the frontline staff in the first few weeks of this uh, initiative. And we quickly realised that we had to provide very advanced training, which we do. Uh, we provide uh, uh, an advanced harm reduction worker training programme, which is 10 sessions delivered over a, a two week uh, period. But you know, just as importantly to progress this, we had full support for, for ADP. And by full support, I mean they were prepared to back uh, the provision of a cash incentive for this new initiative. You know, could, without that, I think it would have been very difficult to encourage clients to come through the door and give us give up some time to go through this. OK, next slide, sorry. So I guess we've identified four key stages for wand implementation, and I think this would be useful for any other area in Scotland that's considering this. The first is often the most difficult step if you like and that's just to have a realization and an acknowledgement that the harm reduction that should be happening in that area just just isn't so if you identify those gaps 
and we want to fill those gaps properly, then we need to make sure our workforce is capable of doing that. And that is where the key training component comes in there as well. Moving over to the implementation, where you would hope to implement the initiative with maximum support. And that maximum support carries on in the monitoring and feedback, which really allows us to improve and develop the initiative as well as the services we're providing to clients. Next slide, please. And just an example of how WAND has, has really, you know, drove change for us in, in Glasgow. We're aware after a very short space of time that many of the individuals that we linked with and provided the, the WAND initiative to were injecting into very high risk injecting sites. You can see they are just, you know, legs, the femoral veins were injecting into the groin, injecting into the neck. Uh, when we were aware there were much lower risk sites available, a number of reasons for that. Many of the people that we provided the WAND initiative to were injecting away from home, you know, likely to be injecting outdoors where it was difficult to see and raise, raise a vein. Uh, again, with the support of the ADP, we were able to purchase five Accuvanes. And for people that's not seen them, they're absolutely incredible. It's like something from Star Trek where it allows you to see viable veins underneath the skin that's not visible to the, to the human eye. It's currently being evaluated just now, but I've been privy to see some of the data from that, uh, and it's going to be, uh, well, it's really incredible, and it's shown that we are managing to use this device along with the comprehensive assessment to reduce drug-related harm. Uh, I think that's it. Next slide, please. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you very much, John. I'm so glad we were able to get the technology to work for us. And um, great to see that technology, actually. Um, and what a massive impact you've had um, in terms of some of those numbers. I think that's fantastic. Um, and it'd be great to continue to keep up to date with how that progresses in other areas of Scotland that take that on board, because I think that's a remarkable turnaround. Um, we are at the end. Mm -hmm. Um, of our session and I do have a number of questions for speakers that unfortunately we don't have time for. So um, just very quickly then before we finish up, can I just say some thank yous? Um, thank you to all of our speakers who have taken time out of their day to kind of share with you their reflections and the implementation of MAT standards so far and some of the key initiatives that have come out of that. Um, thank you for your participation and engagement across the chat and, and the breakout rooms. It's always great to get that contribution. Um, a massive thank you to Lindsay Wallace, who's in the background, our Senior Improvement Advisor, who has knitted all of this together, did all of the negotiation and, and prepped along with a very small team to, to bring this to life today. So a massive thank you to Lindsay. Um, it means a lot for us to be able to get to this stage um, so early in her journey with this work as well as ours. Um, we will share the slides from today um, and really encourage any of you to reach out to us if you've got any specific questions questions or any suggestions for anything that you would like to see in our webinar series as we move forward. Um, there's a short evaluation that I would really appreciate you take the time very quickly to fill out for us. It just helps us make sure that we're meeting the needs of the audience and that you guys are getting out of this as much as we are. And lastly, the last the tentative date we have in the diary so far is the 9th of June. So please put that in your diaries. Um, I'm suspecting we'll have requests for the speakers that we've already had to come back and give us an update on where things are at. Um, but Last but not least, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Um, please enjoy the rest of your day and thank you so much for your contributions.